Did you know getting a bit cold from time to time can help you get fitter, live longer, reduce pain and discomfort and help you concentrate and feel great? And that is not all. I want to talk to you about this so you can optimise yourself. As always, check the description for links to all the studies I reference so you can dive a bit deeper. So let's get down to it. Cold therapy, like the name suggests, is about cooling the body below its naturally comfortable temperature. Our core body temperature is 37 Celsius, but if the air is also 37 Celsius, we feel too warm. And that is because our body needs to be able to lose excess heat to maintain an equilibrium. With an air temperature around the low 20s, we feel most comfortable. However, a swimming pool needs to be around 30 Celsius for you not to feel cold during use, unless you're a swimmer who is training, of course, as the water is a better conductor of energy than air is. A thin layer of air right next to your skin will approach a temperature equilibrium and start to act as an insulator. However, when submerged in water, the cooling process is much more efficient. Indeed, below 18 Celsius, full body wetsuits are recommended even for scuba diving and triathlons, and these are physically active pastimes. For beginners, they are often recommended up to a water temperature of 22 Celsius. So you see, water feels cold even when the air would feel warm. To engage in cold therapy, there are a wide variety of options at your disposal, from wearing less clothing and turning the heating down in winter, to taking a brisk walk on a cold day and reduced clothing. You can cold shower, have a cold or even an ice bath, or you can cold water swim in a lake or the sea. And more recently, you can use a cryotherapy chamber which subjects you to temperatures of between minus 100 and minus 160 Celsius for short periods. So the variables we have at our command are air or water cooling, varying the temperature you are enduring, and also the length of time you are subjected to it. And the positive effects are wide ranging and demonstrable. It is believed sudden cold therapies might have antipsychotic effects similar to those of electroconvulsive therapy because of the way it delivers a mild electroshock to the sensory cortex. Along with the systemic overload of senses and neurotransmission in the mesolimbic system, also known as the reward pathways, and triggered by the fight-flight response, this could be one reason behind its amazing results with both mental and physical issues. Regular cold water swimming is already prescribed medically and shows significant decreases in tension and fatigue with clear improvements in memory and mood. Also cited are significantly increased vigor activity scores, relieved pain from those who suffer from rheumatism, fibromyalgia and asthma, and improved general well-being. Let's get away from these broad generalized statements though and show some hard data supported by scientific studies to try and understand the mechanisms that are at play and then we can use the techniques to our best advantage. So in this study, there were a variety of measurements taken after the subjects had been submerged in water of varying temperatures for an hour. The metabolic rate, the heart rate, blood pressure, plasma renin activity, plasma cortisol and aldosterone. Renin, cortisol and aldosterone are intrinsically related to blood pressure. The rule here is just to watch and monitor your blood pressure if you know it to be an issue. And if you have no idea, well, maybe you might want to get it checked. So, what did they find? Well, with one hour immersion at 32 Celsius, the metabolic rate remained unchanged. Rectal temperature remained unchanged. The heart rate was 15% lower. The blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, were 11 and 12% lower, respectively. Plasma renin activity lowered by 46%, plasma cortisol was lowered by 34%, and aldosterone was lowered by 17%. This is essentially a comfortable temperature and the results here show the benefits of just being in water, a relaxation effect if anything. Then there was immersion at 20 Celsius. 
And we are now at a temperature where the body is actively seeking to warm itself up, but it is not really uncomfortable. Here we saw an increased metabolic rate up by 93%. The body is burning more energy to maintain its core temperature. And this is backed up with a lower rectal temperature, showing the core body temperature was indeed lower than normal. The heart rate and blood pressure were both the same as they were at 32 Celsius. Plasma cortisol decreased slightly more and the rest of the results were similar. Then they looked at immersion in water at 14 Celsius. This would be feeling rather uncomfortable to say the least. And here we saw some more significant changes. An increased metabolic rate up by an amazing 350% a lowered rectal temperature, which corresponds with that, heart rate was increased by 5%, blood pressure increased by 7% and 8% for the two readings, plasma renin was reduced, and cortisol was also reduced. Aldosterone was increased by 23%. What we can see here is the body uprating all its systems to work harder to try and warm itself back up. In this study, they looked at norepinephrine and dopamine levels. Water above 20 Celsius had no effect, but one hour at 14 Celsius increased plasma noradrenaline by 530% and dopamine increased by 250%. Dopamine is also a neurotransmitter or a chemical messenger, and it has a role in how we feel pleasure and aids our ability to think and plan. It also helps us strive, focus, and find things interesting. Here, they used three exposures a week over 12 weeks. They found that 4.4 Celsius water for 20 seconds and cryotherapy of minus 110 Celsius for two minutes both yielded similar results, again showing the thermal capacity of water over air, with norepinephrine rising up to 300%. Dopamine was not measured in this study, but it is highly likely it also saw an increase. Here, they looked at mitochondrial biogenesis in both muscle and adipose tissue, which is the growth and division of pre-existing mitochondria. Cold exposure increased expression of mitochondrial biogenesis-related genes in muscles and had a significant effect on PGC1-alpha protein expression. This makes sense because mitochondria burn energy and burning energy is a good way to overcome the cold. These increases also increased muscle endurance. The body basically created more power plants to get energy. This allows you to process more oxygen, therefore increasing stamina, and the byproduct is heat, so you stay warmer. Then we can also see here that cold exposure helps stimulate and activate brown adipose tissue, which is in itself a thermogenic organ, which then showed an increase in energy expenditure in the brown fat and improvements in glucose homeostasis, insulin sensitivity, and lipid or fat metabolism. There was up to a 37% increase in brown fat seen and also the beijing of previously white adipose tissue. Another mechanism thought to be important with cold therapy is vasoconstriction. Now, as before, too much is not good and too little is not good, but a young body in optimum condition will have the ability to do both when required. An older body with any number of conditions will be suffering from a limited ability in this area. Hot and cold therapies exercise the vascular system to stop it getting overly tight or loose so it can react properly when it is needed. I think you will agree that the evidence for such a wide range of physiological effects makes cold therapy something not to be ignored. From the quick and easy cold shower through to cold water swimming, there is something accessible to everyone. So why not give it a shot? The rule we can take from here, as with sauna evidence, is your need to be outside your comfort zone. The further outside the comfort zone you are, the less time you need to spend there. If you just choose to turn your heating down, you might want to spend the whole day like that. But if you want to jump into an ice bath, then it can be much, much shorter. Whatever you can stand. Although, 
If you want to try this for the first time, make sure you have an experienced person with you in case you experience problems. Maybe start with cold showers and work your way up. And so they are the potential benefits, but what are the downsides and the risks? So as far as we've ascertained, the benefits derived from these treatments come from placing stresses upon your system. And with added stresses come added risks. With treatments such as cryotherapy, the risks are obvious, but hopefully the places offering the treatments are professional. It is not something you can really undertake at home. But these cold treatments make your heart work harder, your blood vessels constrict, and can increase the risk of blood clots occurring. There is a risk of hypothermia and respiratory issues, and the stresses and blood pressure changes can cause problems. Therefore, the elderly and the unfit, and those with cardiac or circulatory issues, and indeed anyone who is not certain they are suitable, should take medical advice from their doctor before undertaking any changes to their regime. Even just stepping into a cold shower could be problematic for some people, and these risks should not be taken lightly. But that said, it is only through stressing our systems that we become stronger. And those at most risk also have the most to gain. Just be sensible, take proper medical advice, and always have someone reliable to help you if the situation should arise. Personally, with cold showers, I just dived right in when I started, but you can always start by slowly reducing the temperature of your shower if you prefer a more gentle introduction. And as with diet, exercise and saunas, the most important factor is to do it regularly. So work out what you can fit in, what you want to achieve and what you have access to and just get down to it. If you have not seen my last video on heat therapies, you can find that by clicking here. Otherwise, why not try this great video? Until next time, thanks for dropping by.